evening. Uh, my name is Neil Murray, and I'm an educator and a, and a military historian. Um, I teach high school U.S. history and military history right in Pine Plains. Um, and I also work with the Living History Education Foundation uh, and do some consulting and some adjunct professor work with Marist College um, Military Academy at West Point. Uh, and I'm also a reenactor of a number of different eras. A few years ago, uh, I did a program here on the, the uh, soldier of the American Revolution. I reached out to David to see if he wanted me to come in and do another talk. Uh, and he thought that World War I uh, would be great as we, we, we are here in the, the 100th anniversary of the end of the, the First World War. Uh, so what I'd like to talk with you about this evening is the, the clothing and the gear uh, and the weapons of a common soldier of, of World War I. Uh, and at any point, if you have any questions, please ask. Uh, I might know the answer, I might not, I'll do my best, um, and we'll uh, take a look at what a, a soldier of the First World War would have been wearing and how they would carry their gear. Um, and I even brought uh, a uniform that's a little bit of an offshoot but connected to World War I that I thought you might be interested in uh, as well that we'll take a look at. So I always like to start with, with, with what I'm wearing right now. Um, and I guess we'll start with the, 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 the head to the toe. So the, the hat here, this is just called an overseas cap, and it's very similar to what we see in World War II uh, and even, even into Vietnam. Um, but these are the first that, that, that we see. Before this, they would have had a campaign hat, uh, which almost looks like a, excuse me, like a, a Canadian Monty, you know, or a, 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 a Park Service hat. Um, and my understanding is those were expensive and hard to get, and, and, you, and you couldn't take it off and just kind of fold it up and, and put it in your pack. Um, so then they went, <coughs> excuse me, to the, the overseas cap. And I'll apologize in advance for clearing my throat. I've had a terrible cold this week, so if I have a little nasally voice, I, I apologize. Um, and I'll, I'll try to remember as well as I go through to, to tell you what's a reproduction and what's an original. So this overseas cap is, is a reproduction, um, but the pin, the U.S. pin, that's an original pin. So overseas cap. Uh, this is a Model 1916 wool service shirt. And it's just a, you know, a, a heavy wool work shirt. Um, and, you know, it's a little uncomfortable in here right now, but you know, it's wool, so it breathes. Um, but this would have been the common issue, issued shirt. Sometimes when they were on parade, they would have worn uh, a, a black tie that would have come to about, about here. Um, but, you know, going into combat uh, or more on the overseas campaigns, they wouldn't have worn the, the tie. The breeches that I'm wearing, you can see how they kind of, puff out a little bit and then get very tight towards the towards your, your knee and then down to your lower leg. Um, these are the model 1912 breeches, US Army issued breeches. And they do have a little, you know, can, they can adjust a little bit in the back. And they get very tight as they come down to your, your shin area. And on my legs, these are called putties. Uh, and it's like, I was described as a giant ace bandage. And it is probably from about me to David. Uh, and you take that and you wrap it tight around your leg, and that's to keep the dirt and the grime and the mud out of your, your boots. Uh, and believe it or not, these putties are, are original. Um, so you can find original clothing and gear out there. Um, you just, I just have to know where to look, and you know, depending on the condition. And, and then you have to make the decision if you do get into the, the ring and acting, you know, if you're going to use that original gear in the field. So I have reproduction putties that I use for, for reenactments, but these are, these are original that I have on um, this evening. And I forget if I mentioned, I, I do do a lot of reenacting as well. Um, and I do a lot of living history like this with my students. Uh, recently, I started a, a World War I program right here at the, the Rhinebeck Aerodrome, um, where my students and I will go. And they actually let me drive the original ambulance. And um, so we, we, we had a, a really immersive experience for them. So I, I do do a lot of this with my, my students as well. Uh, on my feet, these are the, the Model 1917 trench boot. So it's a, a, a leather boot. And it's a hard leather bottom. And then on the bottom of the hard leather bottom are, are hobnails and, and a heel plate, uh, which is why I had to ask for the, the, the little mat here, because it's like walking on, on ice. Um, so the, you know, the hobnails are going to help you with uh, the, the shoes not wearing out as quickly. So you know, just a way to, to, to prolong the life of the, of, of the boot. Um, surprisingly, they're, they're relatively comfortable, but again, that's me wearing these for an hour or two or for a weekend at a reenactment and not for months and months on end. Um, so, you know, <laughs> maybe they're not that comfortable, but, you know, for me, they're, they're, they're not too bad. Would so, those breeches be for riding horses or for everybody? The, the mounted would have had very similar um, breeches like this, but on the inside would have been either an extra piece of, uh, of wool or even a, a piece of leather on the inside. But yes, they look very much like riding shoes. 
Just the style of that era. Yeah, just the style of that era. Sure. Yes, ma'am. You said that that in parades they would wear a tie. Is there there was a, not a dress uniform then? There was not a. No, on on any. And well, is this this is people. So I mean. Um, Officers or not? Everybody this is a. I, I'm going to be dressed as a a, a private infantry soldier. Okay. Um, so yeah, just a, I'm just a just a private. You know, and I forget who was asking when we first started. Um, an officer would have had leather leggings instead of the the puttees. So they would have had a nice tight leather um, legging. Or even you know, we often think of uh, images of General Patton with the the puffy pants. Well, that's kind of that bygone um, era uh, of the, the poofy cavalry pants and he would wear those big boots that came up to his knee um, and it really was a cavalry look but the, 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 the breeches that he wore were very similar um, to this to this era. Neil, yes. these poofies, you said it's like a long ace bandage yep. but how are uh, the ace bandage used to have little metal clips mm -hmm. that held it and you don't have velcro yep. do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not of their original. <laughs> So how do you, oh, you just tie oh, it. Oh, look at it. Oh, you have an actual oh, tie. Yes, yep. Wow. So those go on tight. Now, did that come from India? Because Pachi sounds like an Indian word. I don't know, to be honest with you, the origin of the, yeah. of the term. Oh, and then you just oh. tuck it in. Yeah. You just tie it. And that gets tucked in. Uh-huh. Just like that. Thank you. Sure thing. All right, so uh, moving on to the, the, the code. So this is, so we have the model 1912 breeches, and this is the model 1912 um, tunic. Uh, and it's made out of big, heavy wool. <laughs> and this is also a reproduction. But the buttons on the coat are original. So what I did was uh, to find an original coat. They're out there, uh, but, you know, everybody was a lot slimmer back then. Uh, so I haven't yet found an original that I can wear. Uh, I do have a few in my collection at, at home. So what I decided to do was... Instead of beating up an original, um, was to put original buttons. So all the buttons on this coat are are original, and the collar discs here on my neck these are these are original as well. So one says U.S. and the other has two cross rifles for for infantry. You yes. said a couple of opinions. At least it's from 1912. Mm -hmm. We didn't get into the war till 1917. Correct. Correct. So the U.S. Army um, was still designing and modeling clothing. Uh, and gear just to kind of to maintain the army. Yeah. Um, so they did have models of clothing and gear that predate our, our entry into the war. And but the same things then were used in seventeen. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And even as we see the transitional uniform between World War One and World War Two, it's it's kind of a combination of, of this tunic and then when we start to see the the nineteen forty one or then the the, the Ike jackets, um, where, where we kind of shift away from the the, the, the tunic look. Yeah. Um, so, next is the, the helmet. Would you have had insignia, like on your shoulders or anything? Um, not as a private, no. Not as a no, private. yep, not so I, I am sleep. just a private soldier. Yep, sleep. nope, nope. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, the helmet, this is a Model 1917 um, U.S. Army issued helmet. And it's modeled on the, the British Brody helmet. So, you know, again, um, as you mentioned, 1917, we get into the war, so now we need a helmet. Well, whose helmet are we? Okay, we're, we go with the British helmet. It's very, very similar. Really, the only difference is the, the rivets here um, that hold on the, the chin strap. And this helmet, the shell here, this is original, uh, and the inside is a, a reproduction. Um, you can find originals that have the original lining in it, but it's going to be frail, um, and also they were made with asbestos when they were originally made, so we usually take those out and, and then put in a reproduction liner. What is that made of? This here? Steel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. steel. So, yes, sir? Were they called skimmers? Slime? The, the helmets? Yeah. I'm not sure if they call them skimmers. Yeah, it might, might be, but I, I haven't it's heard that. I'm sure has some Katie's. Oh, okay. I think they were both skimmers. Oh, okay. Could, could very well be. Yeah, I'm not sure. No, now, thank why, you. Why did they call you Doughboys? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I don't know if there's a clear-cut answer to that. Um, what, what I've read and what I've, under, what I've understood is that there, there are stories of going back to the Mexican-American War um, or as far back as the um, American Revolution where, um, I'll start with the Mexican-American War, the button is kind of looked like... Uh, 
like dough, like pastries. Um, and as I understand it, the cavalry called the infantry doughboys. It was almost like a little bit of an insult. Um, but I think the actual origin of the term is, is, is obscure. Um, and, you know, it just kind of becomes this, this tradition where sometimes they would be called doughboys. But um, why World War I did it stick and then kind of fade out, um, I, I don't know that there's a, a specific answer uh, for that. But, but thank you. Um, and taking a look at the field gear, and I'll, I'll put all this on, and then I'll take it off, and we'll kind of take a look at, uh, you know, what, uh, what would have been inside the pack. So as you look at the, the field pack here, okay, so the, the cartridge belt and the canteen are, are original, uh, the pack is original. Um, this is original, and the shovel is original. The only thing that's not original on this is this first aid pouch. Um, the bayonet scabbard is a reproduction, but the bayonet inside of it is, is original as well. I might have to have some help. In some help. How much does Good. that weigh? It's not as heavy as you would think. Is it um, canvas? 20 pounds or so. Can you give me a hand for a second? Is be able to just hold canvas? that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Is that all canvas? Yes, heavy, heavy canvas. So it could get wet easily. Sure. Which and I'm all twisted here. I might need your help again. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So. There's your, your, your pack set up. Uh, so here is the, the cartridge belt. So in these little flaps, and I didn't bring any because um, those, those are real. So I didn't want to bring the real and the bullets for it. Uh, so in here where is where you would keep your, your ammunition. And each one of the pouches, you would have five. So you could carry 10. Um, and they would be on what's called a, a, a stripper or a strip clip. So you could pull that out and I'll show you when we take a look at some of the, the rifles in a minute, and load it just by pushing it right in. Um, and then once you close the bolt, you had five shots before you had to, had to reload. Now the other piece of equipment that they would carry <clears throat> is your gas mask. Oh, yeah. So this is a reproduction, um, and typically you're going to wear it um, over your neck like so, and there's some cords here that you could tie it around your around your back. Um, sometimes they would wear it slung over the side like like so. Um, but typically if you're going to go into combat you would be, be dressed just like just like this. Um, now the gas mask, this is a reproduction. And when I started to acquire all of the, the gear, I looked into buying originals. Um, but as some some reenactors have a little more experience than I do, uh, if I am against that, because if you buy an original gas mask, and you know a lot of these may have been used, there might be some chemicals still in there, and you, you don't want that. <laughs> so let me show you what that looks like. So you could reach in quickly, pull it out. gas attack um, and you would have your rifle so I might as well get that so you can see the full effect and okay. oh did you want a picture? Yes. Okay. Please. Let me catch my breath and then I'll put it back on again. <laughs> has a little mouthpiece. Oh, okay. yeah. And then in the bag, which they would leave it in the bag, but I can pull it out for you. There's a little canister. Mm -hmm. um, and it would have charcoal in there to, to filter out the oh, air. Okay. Oh, oh, I was going to say you're breathing in the bag. Right, right, right. All right. Let's see. Would, would they be able to re replace the charcoal? As a um, I believe so, yeah. And this is actually British. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. You know, so early on in the war, as we're starting to get involved and we're uh, we don't have our own equipment and gear. We were kind of piecemeal to an extent, with, especially with gas masks. So this is this is a British gas mask. All right, let me catch my breath. I'll put it on. Ready? Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
side view is nice too. Oh, yeah. oh that's great. <laughs> you got a full length? I've got like a yeah. side view. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to start to take some of this off, <laughs> and uh, we'll take a little bit more of a look at uh, some other gear here. Okay. Yes, I do. Please, if you don't mind. <laughs> military antiques um, and then as a teacher and a historian and very involved in living history um, you know over time I've kind of gathered and collected all these different items and I drive my wife nuts because it's all over the house and we yelled at open up there and here in New York or um yeah no, uh, mostly oh. yep we have war surplus stores or? um you know army navy stores don't really have what they used to um, it's more knockoff or, or reproduction or, you know, uh, USGI-like kind of thing. Um, so really you can't look there. You know, other collectors, and, and there are re uh, companies for reenactors that will reproduce um, a lot of the items. And a lot of the field gear as well. I mean, you can buy uh, reproduction field gear, but then you have to be careful uh, to, to make sure that it looks the way it's supposed to look. Um, you know, just like anything else, you get what you pay for. There, there's cheaper reproduction items, uh, and then there's more authentic, which, you know, now you're starting to yeah. get more expensive. So, um, I like to use the, you know, the, the original gear if you, if you can find it. Uh, but, so, inside the pack, so we talked about the cartridge belt, and then you have your, your canteen, uh, and this is a first aid pouch, and inside the first aid pouch, is a little field dressing kit. So you would open this up, and in here would be uh, bandages and, and a little bit of uh, um, medicine cream, you know, so kind of just a, what, what you would think of a, a little first aid pouch. <coughs> okay. Now the shovel. This is an original shovel, and that hooks on the pack. Okay, so that's that's an original shovel. So as I always tell my students, you know, what did they dig the trenches with? There you go. Yeah, so that's an original shovel. And um, this is a little bit of a later model. Um, I believe this is the model of the 1910. Um, and the originals did not have this metal piece right here. Oh, dude. Um, so when the soldiers would dig, it would break. Yeah. And the other thing is kind of neat, and uh, I love finding antiques like this, as you can see there's two wood plugs that were jammed in the shovel. Oh. So a soldier did that to, to make the head tighter. So that's, that's kind of neat. So that hooks right on the back of the pack. And the bayonet, we'll, we'll take a look at that when we, uh, when we look at the rifles here in a couple of minutes. Um, but taking a, a walk back this way. This is a raincoat. And this would have been worn over the top of all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, it's, it's like a, I believe it's a, almost like a rubberized cotton. Yeah. So this would go over the top of everything. And I can cheat and take all that off because it would be covered anyway. Um, but I will show you what that looks like. So you'll you'll see a lot of pictures, believe it or not, of of, uh, of, of doughboys wearing wearing these raincoats. Um, they become very popular for for obvious reasons. You know, if you're living in mud, uh, then you're going to want to wear something like this. So the backpack would be yeah. uh, underneath. Yep, yeah, underneath. Yeah. So if you were again. You know, so imagine this being puffed out a little bit more, but all the gear would be would be underneath, and then it has nice pockets, you know, pockets to the raincoat. Uh, and very long. 
you know, when I started doing my research, I'm, I'm on the short side of things, and I knew that this was the, the correct chest size, and I thought, all right, well, should it be this long? But if you look at period pictures of, of uh, soldiers in the First World War, they really are that long. Okay. Uh, no, this is this is an American coat. Yeah, this is uh, model 1917. Huge uh, inside pockets. Yeah. We're not, we're yeah. not wearing it. Where would you carry it? With the inside? Yeah, in the pack. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Did they use like a duffel bag at all when they were carrying? The um, not not to the front, but yeah, they would have um, you know, they would have duffel bags for for the entirety of their uh, possessions. But you know, when you're moved up to the front. And that's that's what you get. So you know you'd have your uh, um, raincoat, you know, in in, in the pack. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this uniform in a little bit. But this is the this is the blanket. So I have a I have a blanket rolled up in here. Um, so you know I usually like to keep one in there, and then here's another one. But this is an original blanket. Um, so if you look closely at this little tag right here, it says 1918. So this, this blanket is 100 years old. Uh, but this is a U.S. Army issued World War One blanket. We have one also. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Yeah. Yes, that's. <laughs> is that he, pure wool? Yes. No. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. So uh, inside the pack, uh, the top of the pack here. That's that's called your meat can pouch. So that's where you would keep this. Right, so um, you can use it to, to cook. You have a plate, um, and you could eat your you're eating your field rations out of this this, this meat can. Uh, and this is original. I think this one. Yeah, this is 1917. All right, so this is original. And these utensils are original, and they're made out of tin. So that's why they're kind of all a little bit gross. So I don't use these in reenactments, but these are real. Um, so those are, are are what your knife and your fork set would look like. And they would fit right inside. Hormel, but it's the same thing. Uh, and they would have had the key on it just like that. Mm -hmm. And you could eat it cold, you know, or you could put it in your meat can and, and heat it up, um, mix it with you know, some rice or whatever you're, you're lucky enough to get. Uh, they also were issued bacon, and you would carry your bacon in a bacon can. So this is a model 1916 bacon can. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one is kind of neat. So I don't know if somebody did this recently or not. But when I bought this, it had a had a candle in it. Um, so who knows? You know, if it could talk, maybe a, a soldier was using it as a candle. Maybe somebody was camping 20 years ago and used it as a candle. I don't know. Um, but I left it in there. I thought that was that was kind of neat. Um, but yeah, all these would be rolled up into the blanket and then into the pack. So the pack would be a little heavier um, and, a, and a little bit wider than, than the way I have mine. Um, but when I do different reenactments or, or parades, uh, we usually just we cheat a little bit and just carry the blanket. So it's a little bit it's a little bit lighter, but as you could attest, it's still pretty, still pretty heavy. Do they have um, a metal cup to drink out of? Yes, the metal cup is buried in here. So here's the canteen. This one's, this one's 1918, so that's, that's an original canteen. Cup. Take some digging out. These are very hard to find originals, uh, but this is a, a hard bread tin. 
So in here would basically be a sleeve of hard bread, saltine crackers. It's basically what they were. So like a, a thicker uh, saltine cracker. Um, and you, you could pop it open and then pull it out and it would be in a wax paper. Uh, and then you could eat that with your, with your bacon. And they even had condiments, believe it or not. How long would that have to last you? Um, I, I'd say a week or so, and then you'd be, be resupplied if you were at the at the front. You know, if, if you were if you weren't at the front, you're not going to have to eat field rations like this. This is when you are deployed and you're you are in the thick of things and you're in the trench and you're you know you're not getting a, a hot fresh meal. Um, and, and my understanding, and again, I, I, I could be wrong. Uh, I believe that was about a week's time, and then you would be be pulled back and you know given a little bit of rest and maybe some sausages and. You know, they did have chuck wagons. Um, there was a big uh, World War I weekend on Governor's Island down in the city uh, last weekend. And there were some guys who depict, you know, I, I usually depict a, a, an infantryman. Um, these guys were depicting uh, cooks. So they had a white t-shirt and, you know, the breeches. And they were making uh, sausage, like Irish, Irish banger sausages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so they, they did have food like that, but not, not up at the front. All right. This is your condiment can. Uh, this is original. So in here would be coffee on one side, and then the other side, so there's a little divider in the middle, um, would be sugar. So when they were in the field or in the trenches, was there a place for them to get water? Did they sit in the... Um, well, they couldn't leave to get the water, so, you know, water would be brought up. Uh, I've seen a picture of, um, like, a pack animal with big water jugs on, on either side. Um, so they would bring water up as, as, as best they could. Um, but, you know, if you, you've, you've seen or read about the, the, the Lost Battalion, how they, were, they had no water, and they were sending guys, unfortunately, down to a stream, and it was very dangerous. So, you know, um, water would have been a, an important commodity, but at times hard to, hard to get. Okay, let's see. What else? Uh, this is a compass. So this is a, this is an original compass. Okay, so just a regular soldier's pocket compass. Uh, and then your your lighter. But you can only see it in the daytime. So this is this is an original trench lighter. So if you were, you know it would have been filled with uh, it still sparks. There you go. So it would have been filled with you know uh, butane, I believe, and there you go. So kind of like a zip ball, you know. I remember those kind of lights. This is a soap dish. So this is an original army issued soap dish. So when it's made out of a really cheap tin, um, but you would have a bar of soap in there. Huh. And again, all of this would be wrapped up in your blanket, in, in your back. Okay. So, um, let's see. Did they issue them watches or not? Uh, they did. I, I don't have one. Uh, I don't know that every soldier would have been issued a watch or it would have lasted long enough to you know, make it worth, worth wearing. Um, but there, there, were, there were army issued watches, yes. Sure. Uh, this is a, an original bugle. I don't know how to play it. Um, but, you know, bugles being used in the Civil War and, uh, and, and, and on up were, were very common. Um, so some field music of, uh, of, the, of the Doughboy in the First World War um, would have used bugles like this. So that, that's an original bugle. This one I don't believe is military issue, uh, but it's, it's from the era. Let's see. So, There's no towel or washcloth. No. <laughs> yeah. use, your, use your blanket. <laughs> right. um, so why don't we shift down a little bit and we'll, we'll take a look at some of the, the, uh, the weapons. So first here, this is an infantry officer's sword. So these are really for parade. Um, they're not going to carry these in the trenches, but I, I thought I would bring it to show you anyway because it is a World War I era sword. Uh, the sword knot here, this is original as well. So the theory behind that is you put your hand in there, and then when you're holding the sword, um, you know if you if you drop it, um, or if you're 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 wounded, then it's it's still kind of attached, and you and you don't lose it. But that's pretty fragile, so I don't want to put my hand in there. Um, and these would have been worn on a pistol belt like that that we'll we'll take a look at in a moment. And it's it's pretty neat. So it's you know adorned with patriotic scrolls. Um, it says U.S. on one side. And the maker of this one is Francis Batterman. So uh, Batterman was a, a big military dealer in New York City. 
and then famously moved up to, to Bannerman's Island. Yes, correct. Yeah, so this one's what's this one's Francis Bannerman. But he dealt in the um, you know like army navy stuff, the leftover yeah. Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, there. yeah, and that's that's part of the reason why uh, trying to find and I'll, I'll talk about that when we take a look at some of the, the rifles. Trying to find a, a you know an intact original rifle is very hard to do. Because after the war, nobody said, oh, you know what, 100 years from now, all these guys you know, <laughs> want to do lectures, and I mean, they, they cut the barrels off, got rid of the stocks, and made them just into hunting rifles. Um, they called them, you know, sporterized. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt's actually famous for, for being fond of a, a, a model 1903 sporterized uh, rifle that he took on his, his, his hunting campaigns in, um, in Africa. Um, so it's, it's hard to find them intact. In, in so this is a cavalry saver. So this is the model 1913 Cavalry Saber. It's the last Cavalry Saber um, that the United States Army issued. Uh, and the designer of the model 1913 Cavalry Saber has, has given its nickname. It is, it is the, uh, the Patton Saber. Um, so uh, I believe it was a lieutenant at the time, Lieutenant George S. Patton, uh, designed the last Cavalry Saber. Uh, this one in particular, uh, this is 1914. So this is one year after, and this is original. Um, and Patton's philosophy was that to change from the, the curve design of the, of the Civil War and, um, and the Spanish-American War and all the way back to the American Revolution to more of a, a, more of a, a thrusting or it almost looks like a fencing um, of sort. So these really were not deployed, to my knowledge, in, in any sort of combat. Um, but they are highly desirable and collectible because it's attached to patent, which is why I want it one. Um, but it is an, an original um, you know, World War I era, but before World War I, 1914 here. Um, issued patent sword. I believe they stopped making these in, in 1919, um, to my understanding. The machine gun and, and rapid fire cannon took care of that. Yes, no, no more need for the, for the horse uh, and the cavalry. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's an interesting comment in and of itself. You know, when we look at Patton, not that we'll get into World War II, but you know, he's a World War I veteran as well. And he pretty quickly realizes, I mean, he's a cavalry guy. Um, he's designing the cavalry sword and he's, you know, there's pictures of him on horses and and as we get into World War I, he pretty quickly realizes that this and the horse is, is useless. Uh, and then he is one of the first to recognize the tank as being the future. Um, even though there was so much resistance in the, you know, the, the, the high brass at the time in the Army, um, that, that's that, that these tanks, they're slow and they're not going to work, and we still need the swords and the horses, and Patton said, no, no then we, you know, the, the tank is the future. And, and as history would prove, he was right, um, becoming our, our famous tank commander in, in World War II. Okay, let's see. There are a couple of original books here. I don't want to forget to talk about those, so I'll move down the, the, the table here. So this is a 1917-issued uh, manual for infantry. So when you entered in the Army, they would give you this book uh, to tell you everything you need to know about being in the infantry. Um, but this is an original from, from 1917. And this one in particular, I just got it, so I haven't researched the gentleman, but um, this was owned by a man named Warren Knapp, who was in Company E of the 60th Pioneer Infantry Division. So that's kind of neat. So I'll have to look up uh, that soldier. So it's, it's personalized, which is kind of neat. Uh, this book, you know, I'm in neat connection with the aerodrome right here, but this is a 1918 edition um, about aviation engines. Uh, so it's all the different designs of the, the engines that were in the planes during that era. And if I can find a page to show you. They wouldn't carry those books with them, would they? Um, no. no. Um, there's a whole bunch of pages like that that say censored. So the U.S. government was censoring uh, the information on the, the engine, uh, which I thought was kind of neat, you know, to see that, that they didn't want this technology to get in the hands of, of, of the enemy. So uh, it, was, it was censored. And the last book, this is also an original. This is 1919. Uh, but America's War for Humanity, so it's a, it's a history of our involvement in World War I, uh, not knowing that we're going to be in a, you know, another World War that's going to be worse. Uh, so, another uh, original book. Okay. Let's see. So, moving down the table here, uh, I'll start with the German Mauser first. Okay. So, this is an original German Mauser. Um, it's a G, so their, their version of Model 98. So it's actually 1898. Uh, but what, what's interesting to think about with the, the German Mauser is the Mauser action, which is this part right here. Um, 
is really what everyone's using in World War I. So it's the Mauser action versus the Mauser action versus the Mauser action. Um, so the American rifles I'm going to show you, they're a Mauser action. The British rifles, um, French, they all have that, that bolt action um, to them. And uh, this one in particular is 7.9 uh, millimeter. Um, and this one, I believe, this was made in 19, 1915. So that, that's an original German Mauser. And the bayonet for the German Mauser, got the walk gingerly over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were different styles, uh, but this is uh, an example of a, of a German bayonet um, that would have been used with, with that Mauser. Some of them had wider blades or butcher blades, if you've heard of that before, or saw back blades. Um, this one's more of a, of a thrusting bayonet, um, but that's an example of a Okay, so moving into the American arms. Okay, this is a U.S. model uh, 1903 uh, rifle, uh, and this is this is original as well. Um, and I actually just finished restoring this. So as we were talking about the the sporterized, uh, when I found this, it had a, a sporterized stock on it, um, and I. I bought the, the correct military stock, which has a finger groove here, uh, and this is called a handguard, uh, and, and put this all back together. So this is, this is a World War I configuration. Uh, and what I like about this one is it shows um, a, a, a World War I rebuilt. Okay? So the action right here, so this is, this is called the receiver. This receiver is from 1906. So the receiver is from 1906. Um, and they would have been used in the Mexican punitive expedition. Uh, I believe that there was an insurrection that we dealt with in the Philippines. I, I think that was the first time these were deployed. Um, but as, as the war breaks out, there are not nearly enough of these on hand. Um, and we'll talk about what, what most U.S. soldiers would have been armed with in a moment. Uh, but as the United States develops this, so this, this one is from, made in Springfield Armory uh, in, in uh, Massachusetts. My understanding, and I haven't read enough to tell you anything beyond this, uh, is that the action was so close, it, it's basically a, a copy or, or a ripoff of the Mauser, um, that Mauser sued the U.S. government for, for stealing the idea. Um, so they, they really are, they, they're, they're the same. Uh, and the way they work, it's a bolt action rifle. So remember we had the, the cartridge belt on. So you would pull out your, your five rounds, and then it's on a, on a little clip. You just push it right in. Now you're ready, okay? And then every time you shoot, bang, 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 you can shoot that fast, right? Um, the, the 1903 is very popular uh, by collectors, and, and I agree. Um, this is one of my favorites. It has a, just a very nice look and design to it. Um, and as, as we get involved in the war, there's, there's just not enough of these. So we need to arm our soldiers with, with something else. Now there were some armed with a 1903, but that's kind of a myth uh, that, that, that most of our soldiers would have had these, that they wouldn't have. Uh, most soldiers would have been armed with this rifle. And this is based on the uh, Pattern 14 British Enfield. Uh, so sometimes it's referred to as the, the American Enfield. Uh, but the, the correct terminology would be the U.S. Model 1917 rifle. Um, and it works the same way. Okay, so in this one in particular, you have to push down a little bit. So every time, uh, and then you're ready to fire. Uh, but you know, as you look at the lines on it, it's not as, as, as pretty or as good looking as the, as the 1903, but it, it, it's really more practical. I mean, you can tell it's a little bit beefier. So the majority of American soldiers would have been would have been equipped with with this rifle. How heavy is that? Um. Nine pounds. Yes, sir. Did Remington make most of those? Um, yes, thank you. This one is Eddystone, um, which was a... Uh, so the three companies that made these were Winchester, uh, Remington, and, and Eddystone, which was a division of, of, um, of Remington. Yeah, so and thank it, you. Eddie's uh, uh, long ago, uh, back in the 60s or 70s, he worked at a coupon museum in, in near Wilmington, Delaware. And we, I used to go, they had a group of young people that played volleyball mm -hmm. at Eddie Stone. And I think some of the buildings are still there. Oh, okay. South of Philadelphia. Oh, neat. Yeah, oh, thank you. 
Uh, now all these can be fitted with a bayonet, so, and I skipped over that. So this is a bayonet for the, the 1903. So <clears throat> it's in a model 1910 scabbard, and it's a model 1905 bayonet. So this is, this is an original bayonet. Uh, and this one's dated 19, 1918, so that fits right on the end of that uh, model 1903. And then... bayonet on the end of the model 1970. And this bayonet's original as, as well. Okay. Yes, thank you. I forgot to mention that. So the round that would be shot through the, the 03, uh, the 1917, and then up through and into World War II and the M1 Grand is, is a 30-06 uh, round. So they would have used those and, and kept that interchangeable because of the, you know, the, the amount of ammunition that would have been on hand um, so that you could use the same ammunition in, in both of those. Now, the, the 1903, by, by modern standards, most, most gunsmiths advise against shooting them live. Uh, and that's because the receiver initially was, was single heat treated instead of double heat treated. So they are, 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 are prone to explode. <laughs> 99 out of 100 times, you, you're probably fine, uh, but I'm not willing to take that chance. I do know some guys that are okay with it, but I, I don't. Um, you know, so that's really a, a collector's uh, collector's arm. Yes, ma'am. How long have you been collecting these? Uh, 15, 20 years? No, um, about 12. Uh -huh. about, about 12 years. Now, do you have to maintain uh, the to worse, so you don't worsen the rusting of the? Metal yes, um, I have a couple hours ahead of me when I get home. Because <laughs> um, all the handling of it, all the grease is on my hand. I'm sweating. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll all have to be wiped down and clean. The bore is fine because we're not running and what shooting do you it. Use? Um, just no, normal, Hoppy. modern, yeah, hops mm -hmm. nine gun cleaning, you know, uh -huh. modern, modern mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, yes. Now the other thing that I brought to show you um, is an original. Colt 1911. Um, so this is, this is a real one, and the the frame here. This was made in 1918, but the slide, which is this top part right here, that's an earlier slide. So the slide on this, which is this part that slides back like that, um, that was probably made about 1913. Um, so that this, that's very old, uh, and this one in particular shows a lot of, of of combat use. So I can tell that this was not a surplus arm that would have sat in. Uh, you know, a warehouse and, and then been sold on the, on the collector's market. Um, and, you know, as I always joke with my students, I kind of like the ones that have the been there, done that look for two reasons. <laughs> I'm a historian more than a collector, and if it was pristine, there was no way I could afford it. Um, <laughs> so that, that's the other, the other reason. Uh, but this is a real one. And the way these would be loaded, <coughs> I'll show you the, the, the belt and the, the, car, the um, holster and so on in a moment. Um, so it's an eight round magazine. And it's it's half blued. So when we get to World War II, you'll see that they are they are fully blued. But in World War One, they're, they're they're half blued. Excuse me. And then that goes in like that. And now it's ready, right? And it's it's these are semi-automatic, which is amazing to think that the, the gun design in 1911 is used by the U.S. Army until the until the 1980s. Um, nice. And you know they're they're still a very desirable and collectible uh, weapon because they're so simple. You can take it apart very easily. You can throw it in the dirt and the mud, pick it up, and it's it's still going to work. Um, but it's it's semi-automatic. So every time you pull the trigger, boom, 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 eight times. Um, and then what will happen is on the eighth shot, it'll stay like that. It, it stays open. Drop that out. Put another one in, and then you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Safety. Um, yes. Let's see. The safety is right here. That's it. You just flip that up. Um, other than that, there's no, no safety. Um, and then you actually have to squeeze. That has to be squeezed in your hand for it to for it to, to go work. work. Yeah. What's that? Oh, just you have to squeeze that for it to work. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. A pistol belt. So this is an example of a, this is an original pistol belt. So an officer is going to carry the, the 1911. 
um, you know, the similar similar uniform on, so that <coughs> pistol belt. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Goes around your waist. <coughs> I apologize. And you have your holster on it. <coughs> so that's an original holster. This holster was made in 1918. Mm -hmm. So um, the original holsters, I don't use these for a living history because this one's in really, really good shape. Uh, but this one was made in 1918. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to have to take a drink. I apologize. And also on the pistol belt will be your magazine pouch. Mm -hmm. so that would slide on the belt. And then in there you could keep two more magazines that would have been full of, uh, full of eight rounds. And this, this magazine pouch, this one's 1918. So that one you might be able to see back there. So you can see it says 18 on there. And this is an older style. So this one is 1917. So you can see the, the difference. And they made so many of these. That's, we don't see too many of these in World War II, but if you look at a lot of World War II pictures, you'll see a lot of these magazine pouches still being issued and still being used in World War II. Okay, I don't see the difference really. Yeah. Do the ring masters ever go back to you know, some of the war, you know, the fields of battle in France? Um, they, they do. Uh, but it's a lot harder. So as I mentioned, I do Civil War reenacting and, and, and uh, American Revolutionary War reenacting and French and Indian War. That's a lot easier. <coughs> you know, even the American Revolution, that's, that's right here. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work up at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, so there you're on the actual site and the actual ground, you know. But for me, I've never been to the, to the World War I battlefields in Europe. Because um, they could like charter a plane if there are a whole bunch of yeah, people that's, active. That's true. That, that, <laughs> yes, that is true. Um, but I, I'm sure they do it in Europe, but I, yeah. I, I'm not as, as familiar. So the other thing I brought that I thought would be interesting, um, and then I'll see if you have any questions. I'll do my best to ask or answer them. Excuse me. Uh, is a, 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 an offshoot of the First World War um, connected to it and connected to the United States, and and that's the the uh, the Easter Rising in Ireland, um, and I do have a uniform from that from that. That was 1916. That's right. Um, and they, it, it's kind of an, an interesting topic to look at, and in how, you know, here you have the Irish who are looking to the Germans to give them weapons, but yet right in their proclamation, which is their equivalent of the Declaration of Independence, it says supported by her exiled children in America. So here you have our enemy, but then we're their friends and. So it's an interesting story, um, and and for me, oftentimes it surprises people when uh, I do all these reenacting, especially Civil War and the American Revolution, and they say, "Oh, you must have had an ancestor," and I don't. Um, you know, I, I, I'm the product of Ellis Island immigration, um, so I, I don't go that far back. Uh, but I do have a an ancestor who's a pretty famous Irish patriot. Uh, his name was was Sean Houston. Um, he was one of the leaders of the the, the rebellion. He was a, a, a blood relative. Of Anyway, I thought it would be interesting to show you that uniform as well because it is World War One era. It is very similar to what the British would have been wearing, um, and I'll, I'll I'll show you that, and we'll see if you have any questions. <coughs> so the, the tunic is very similar. <coughs> and it's green, obviously. <laughs> and it's wool. Um, <coughs> but what, what's neat is that the the uniform has a has a blend of words in Irish and words in English. Um, so on my shoulder it says IV, which is Irish Volunteer. And on the buttons it has a harp. Not, not a shamrock. And not definitely not a clover. I tell my students that one's not a clover, it's a shamrock. Um, but oftentimes people think that the official symbol of Ireland is a shamrock. It's actually a harp. Um, so it has harps on it. And it fits very tight. Uh, but it has harps on it and, and an IV for, for Irish volunteer. And the bandolier is actually a, a British bandolier. So that goes over your shoulder like that. Uh, and this actually would be buttoned under here. Let's see if I can get that for you. It's hard to do without a mirror, so I... Did they use linen for any of the shirts or the lining? Um, yep, yeah, this is this is actually lined in linen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
I think I got it. There we go. Okay. So this is a British bandolier. And the belt. Uh, no, no, th th this is all reproduction. Um, yeah, so think of the number of soldiers in, that we had in World War I, and then the number of soldiers in, in the Rising. Um, to find original stuff like this from, from that era is astronomical in, in, in cost. I have a couple of original buttons, and I'm not even going to say, I'm not going to tell you on camera what I, what I paid for those. Um, <coughs> the, the hat. Uh, would have looked like this. Um, yeah, so it's a different uniform. I thought you, we, since we're talking about World War One, and, and there is that connection with the United States uh, and, and Germany. Uh, but what, what's neat about the, the, the hat is the, the defense forces in Ireland today, they still wear a very similar hat, um, and the, the badge is the same. So on the badge is a sunburst, which is kind of like a uh, symbolic of the, uh, the ancient mythology of, of, of the Irish warriors. Uh, and then it says Fianna Foil on it. And, and that means soldier of, of destiny. Um, so to say Fianna Foil, basically that means, okay, you're referring to the Irish army even today. Um, and that goes back to uh, Finn McCool. I don't know if you're familiar with the stories of Finn McCool. Uh, and Finn McCool's army was called the Fianna. Uh, and then they called Ireland the island of, of destiny. So the Fianna uh, me, meaning army and then and Foil meaning, meaning destiny. So I thought that you would find this interesting uh, and, and its connection as well. Now, the, the pants they would have worn um, would have been very similar with poop tees and everything, but it would have matched the coat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been that, that darker group. Okay. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun.